Hello and welcome to another episode of 8-Bit Keys. Today I'm going to be looking at this very interesting piece of hardware. Now, this was donated to me by Paul Ortola, who's out of the Baltimore, Maryland area. And uh, this is a, uh, a little keyboard that plugs into the Commodore 64, but it's very different from any of the other keyboards that I've shown before. In previous episodes, I've shown you the incredible musical keyboard overlay that just goes on top of the C64. And I've shown the SFX sound expander, which plugs into the cartridge port. Let's take a close up look at the box on this one. It was made by a company called Sequential. According to the advertising, it's a real music keyboard for the Commodore 64 with disk drive. Apparently you can record 10 minutes of your music. It has 8 instruments to choose from and can play up to 3 notes at one time. So let's open it up and see what's inside. So this looks like some software. And let's get this keyboard out of the box. Ok, so onto the software package, they show some other keyboard, not sure what model that is, but uh, it's certainly not what came in the box. Inside we get a user's manual. It's small, which is good, that means the software isn't too complicated. And we get three floppy disks. Ok, so it's a little dirty and a little yellowed, but not too bad. Here's the thing I find most interesting, it connects to the C64 via the joystick port. So I decided to clean it up a little because I hate the feeling of trying to play on dusty keys. Ok, so it's all cleaned up now. I wanted to show you that it has uh, little handles on each side which is kind of neat. There's not really anything on the back at all or on the bottom. So one of the reasons I find this device immediately fascinating is because it connects to the joystick port. Now that may seem perfectly normal to a lot of people, but it baffles me and I'll show you why. Look at the joystick port and you'll see that there are only 5 digital input output lines available here. And yet there are 32 keys. Even if this were to be wired into a matrix, you would still need at least 9 digital lines to make that work. So that leaves me wondering if there's some kind of brain inside of this keyboard that is you know, taking the keys and converting them to some kind of serial data, which the, key, uh, the joystick ports on the C64 are capable of operating in that manner, even though they were rarely used that way. So we're definitely going to have to take this thing apart before we're done here. In the meantime, let's go ahead and connect it up to a good old fashioned Commodore 64. So I have no idea what the difference is between these discs. We've got the SoundMaker software but these two disks look absolutely identical. I guess we should put them in the disk drive and find out what's on them. Ok, so there isn't a whole lot on this disk, it's mostly empty. Let's try the second disk. Ok, now I'm curious to see if the identical looking disk has identical software on it. Well, that confirms it. <laughs> Apparently these last two disks are actually identical. So I'll put the first disk back in and start loading. In a moment you'll hear this thing headbang, which means it's going through some copy protection scheme. I think it's kind of silly to put copy protection on a disk like this because the software is essentially useless without owning the hardware that goes with it. So eventually it asks you if you'd like a description of how the sound maker works. It was quite rare to have in software documentation in 1984. Rather than read all of this to you, I'll just show you how it works. You can immediately just start playing if you want. So you can use the function keys to move around the different adjustments that you want to make. So for example, I can go down an octave. Let me move over here and play with the release rate and you can hear what a difference that makes. Now I have a sound really similar to that used in the famous Swenth demo. Let me see if I can play some of it. So let's play with different sounds. Let's change it to variable. What this is really doing is changing the pulse width of the SID chip. Ok, so let's try out the second disc. It actually just comes up and starts playing this song and I can't figure out how to stop it. I even looked through the manual, but it doesn't describe this program at all. After some messing around with keys, I finally figured out what some of the keys do. For example, the function keys change the different sounds, making the bars move to the right, and if you hold down shift, it makes them move back to the left. 
So I'll just try playing the piano here. So I really don't like this second program at all. It's not really very easy to use, doesn't make a lot of sense, and uh, it doesn't have octave changes on it. And also, I didn't really bother creating any kind of multi-track performance or anything because, well, let's face it, this thing really just uses the uh, internal SID chip and everybody knows what that sounds like already. So instead, I decided to do a little investigation on the joystick port. I wrote a little program in BASIC to monitor the I.O. pins on the joystick port, and then I pressed some keys on the keyboard. However, as you can see, there was no change. So this thing is very mysterious indeed. On the bottom, there are a few screws, which is actually sort of annoying since they're flat tipped. However, it isn't easy to take apart as it appears because the sides are glued on from the factory. But I was pretty sure I could get it apart without breaking it, and I did. Well, almost anyway. I did apparently break one of these wires, but I can solder it back. It appears the only way to see the circuit board is to remove the keys, so that's what I did. So there are all of the keys. Now you can see the board layout. There definitely appears to be some sort of 40 pin dip package right there in the middle. However, there doesn't appear to be any way to see the other side, and unfortunately the circuit board is glued down. I didn't originally plan to retrobrite this, but since I've already taken it this far apart, I figured I might as well before I put it back together. I only needed to mess with the white keys because the black keys look exactly like they're supposed to. I put them out in the sun and let them soak for a few hours. In the meantime, I turned my attention to this huge crack. I'm pretty sure I did not cause this, but it shouldn't be too hard to fix. I just put some super glue down in the crack and then I used this uh, long clamp to keep it together while it sets. I had found this other little piece rattling around in the case, so I glued it back on too. I got the soldering iron out. Now originally this wire was soldered on the back side, but there's no way for me to reach it now, so I'll just solder it to the other side and I'm sure it'll work fine. By the way, I noticed that these keys have no springs, instead just a piece of foam. That explains why the keys feel so mushy. So here are the keys after three hours in the sun. Time to rinse them off. Okay, so the black keys have to go on first, and then here are the rest of them. And as you can see, it looks much better after the Retrobrite. So now I can slide the key mechanism back into the case, but I'll have to mix up some epoxy to get the side piece to stay back on. And this epoxy takes 12 hours to cure, so I'll have to clamp it overnight and then check on it in the morning. Alrighty then, so it's all put back together and it works as good as new. You can't even tell I had it apart and the keys look great now. So what is my final verdict on this product? Well, um, I think it's a very fascinating piece of history and uh, I'm going to love having it as part of my collection. But um, I don't know, there's a lot of things I don't like about it. It's definitely better than the musical keyboard overlay because it has more keys and the keys are definitely easier to use because the overlay keys are so small. Um, but it still doesn't have enough keys uh, to comfortably play anything on. <laughs> uh, so that's always a problem. And the keys also feel somewhat spongy when you push them. And of course now I know why, now that it's literally a sponge that it's pushing on inside. But um, the software is fairly primitive. Although I kind of liked the first piece of software in many ways it resembles the software I wrote, SID keys, which uh, basically just allows you to change all of the uh, parameters of the SID chip. The other thing I do like about it is the fact that it uses the joystick port so it doesn't require a cartridge or any, any clunky adapters or anything like that. It's a pretty simple device to plug into the C64 and apparently it does have some kind of microcontroller as we saw but we never did really get a good look at it. So at least that mystery's more or less solved. Also, a lot of people have been asking me about the software I created called SID Keys, and I've never actually finished it yet, but I got tired of emailing it to everybody individually, so it is now available on my website. It's kind of in an alpha version. It sort of kind of works. A lot of features are not implemented yet, but you're welcome to go download it. Um, I'll put a link here in the description field. And um, Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this episode, and uh, stick around because, as always, I have more coming.